Welcome to Michigan State University Extension. My name is Monica Smith and I'm your Extension Educator for Food and Nutrition. And today we're gonna to be talking about home canning. And I cannot tell you how, I, how excited I am that there is um, a whole new rebirth of this process um, in our society. This is really important stuff and I thought it was gonna be one of those things that falls away that your great grandmother did and then never passed it on. And I'm finding out that that's not the case and this is a really great thing. Why preserve food? As you look up here and you see these reasons why we preserve food, you may notice that to save money is not listed up there. It may or may not be less expensive to preserve your own food. It depends on if you're growing it yourself, what you're going to have to pay for it at the market, what kind of startup expenses do you have? Do you already have a can or do you already have jars? Do you already have lids, rings? Um, the cost of running your air conditioner, if you're going to air condition canning, which I'm really fond of, as somebody who grew up in the South, who canned in August with her mother with no air conditioning. So I can assure you, the air is on at my house when I am canning. <laughs> Plus the energy to run the stove. It's not necessarily cheaper, but it for sure is more um, fresh. It for sure is exactly what you're going to expect it to be. Um, and I love this one, the sense of satisfaction. When I was a little girl at my grandmother's house, uh, we would go to my grandmother's house, and she had this walk-in pantry that had uh, bookshelves, looked like bookshelves on three sides, so when you walked in, you were in this U. And from floor to ceiling was canned goods. And I thought that was the prettiest thing I had ever seen. I would sit in that little closet, and I would take my dollhouse and my dolls and my books, and I would sit in there, and I would be like, this is beautiful. So that sense of satisfaction is also um, really important. If you've been noticing the sodium contents of food lately, canned food, frozen food, it's really gotten out of control. I should not have to um, expect to find 250 milligrams of sodium in frozen spinach when by nature it's only got between 25 and 30. So there's a lot of ways to preserve. You can freeze, you can dry, you can can. Today we're gonna to talk about canning. Next month we're gonna talk about drying. That is a super old um, way to preserve food that is very cost efficient. Um, and the shelf life is very long. We'll talk about that next month. But today we're talking about canning, long shelf life. But this is the one that if you mess it up, you can kill someone. This is the one that requires the highest level of expertise. Botulism is something that you really don't want. So, <laughs> does she look familiar? I've been doing this for years and no one's died yet. Well, that may be true, but food safety has to be our number one priority here. Um, I thought this was a great analogy here. Canning is not cooking. It's not about cooking. This is about preserving food. You take what you preserve, then you cook with it and make it your own. So when you are canning, you must control microorganisms. You must make sure your product is safe. And it's not always you can't tell by the way it looks. You can't tell by the way it tastes. Some organisms are completely undetectable. So let's do this in comparison. You're at your grocery store, you see this bin of green beans, it says five cents a can, but they don't know if they're safe or not. Do you want to buy them? You don't? Come on, they're only five cents a can. Don't you, I mean, aren't you going to buy that whole bin? I don't think so. So don't do it at home either. If you think, hmm, I'm just going to throw these in a jar and they'll be all right and they're cheap because people next door gave me a bushel of beans. Probably not a good idea. So this is the first rule of canning. Use current tested recipes. That means if you've got your grandma's recipe books, if you've got your grandma's canning recipes, you should not use them. 
we are dealing with organisms, bacteria, that were not around at the time of your grandmother. Our fertilizers come from all over the world. Our seeds come from all over the world. We are dealing with whole, totally, uh, a totally different type of uh, bacteria now. So, when you use a tested recipe, we know that the time, the pressure, the heat are all guaranteed to kill whatever possible organism could be in that food. I gave you um, a handout. If you didn't, you can get it on the way out. That gives you reliable sources on the internet for um, food preservation. University of Georgia at Athens, that's our um, National Center for Home Food Preservation. You can be assured beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything you get from that website is safe. Likewise, the Ball Blue Book. If it's a new version, 2005 or later, if you've got a ball blue book that you picked up at the used bookstore for 25 cents, like I did, <laughs> that is from the 1950s, it's interesting, but it's not safe. So you may not use those. So much to my dismay, I have to tell you to control your creativity when you are canning. In order for food to be safe when it's canned, it's got to have heat, it's got to have time. So, how do they know how much heat and how much time? Well, it's how much acid is in the food naturally occurring, the density of the food, the altitude, the starting temperature. This is really important, the starting temperature. The size of the container, quarts or pints. Which do you think would take longer to process? A quart, yeah, it's got more stuff in it to be evenly heated all the way through to the center of this jar where there's no cold zone, it's going to take longer. However, does anybody have any 64 ounce jars at homes, the half gallons? Like my grandma used to can in the half gallons because she had 12 children, right? Remember those days? Yeah. <laughs> they no longer recommend that you can in 64 ounce jars. These are your two options or some recipes will let you can in half pints if you're doing jams, jellies, sauces, sometimes you can find recipes that will tell you what the processing is for a half pint, but the large ones, no. So, you know that I've got a different size jar, I have a different size canning time, which means you can't put pints and quarts in the same canner, right? You know how you're doing, let's say you're going to can tomato sauce, and your canner holds um, nine quarts and you have just enough sauce to fill eight quarts in one pint. Doesn't work that way. You're gonna have a pint that's over-processed. It would be safe, but it would be mush. You'd be better to take that one quart and go ahead, I mean that one pint and go ahead and eat it, or you could freeze it. So, acid content of food. That tells you how you're gonna can. Are you gonna can with a pressure canner? Are you gonna can with hot water bath canner. Has anybody ever done pressure canning? Is anybody afraid to pressure can? Why have they scared us? They have created just fear in us with pressure canning. A pressure canner, at least today's pressure canners are very safe and very easy to operate. And if you're gonna can anything that has a low acid content, which is down here, which is basically all vegetables except tomatoes. Um, up here, you've got your fruits and tomatoes up here. Basically everything else requires a pressure canner because in order to kill those organisms you got to get to 240 degrees and you can't get that without pressure, right? Water boils at 212. So you can kill mold, you can kill yeast, but the anaerobic things, the ones that will kill you, the botulism bugs, have to reach 240. So. We've all heard about botulism and nobody wants it. It's a spore. It's in the soil. You can't detect it. It shows nowhere. There's no way to look at something to know. If you eat a carrot from the ground, you can wash it and eat it without any ill effect. But when you add these things to it, an anaerobic or no oxygen atmosphere, then it becomes scary. So you must follow the recipe exactly. 
You have to use the pressure and the heat that it tells you to use in the recipe, only in the recipe. Here's the difference. Can you see that, that little pointer thing? Okay, this is a hot water bath canner. You'll notice here, the jar is completely covered, one to two inches with water, and then another one to two inches for um, air space so that the water can boil briskly. You'll notice here, this is really important, rack space. Does anybody buy things like from garage sales or at Goodwill? Sometimes you could pick these up really cheap, these hot water bath canners, but you gotta make sure that you're gonna get a rack with it. You can't just set the jar on the bottom. You also wanna make sure that there's no nicks or um, dings or any rust areas on this area of the canner because if you're canning away and you're boiling and that rust breaks through and your kitchen is flooded in boiling water, not a good thing. So if you're gonna buy this used, make sure that it's a good canner intact and that the lid fits well. There's the rack, see? Okay, Hot, uh, pressure canner, gauge or weighted gauge? Dial gauge, weighted gauge. Anybody seen both of these? The beauty of this one is it requires no maintenance. It's always good. So if you need five pounds of pressure, this little thing would hook right here. If you needed 10 pounds, there's a little hole right here that you would hook here, and there's 15 that would hook there. It's good, you never have to worry about it. If you have um, a dial gauge, you need to have those calibrated every year. You need to make sure that they're good. And we can calibrate those for you here at MSU. We don't charge for that, but you do need to call in advance so we can make sure somebody is here to help, you, help with that. You'll notice here's your same rack, but look, here's the water right here. It doesn't go all the way to the top because really steam, this is boiling and steam is what is doing the process here, not the water. If you buy one of these used, you wanna make sure that the seal is intact. There's a seal right here, that there's no nicks or dings in either the lid or um, in the top of the pot. You wanna make sure that this gauge is intact and this right here comes with it. I saw a really nice one of these canners at an antique store the other day. I paid, last year I paid um, about $99 for mine on sale, which was a great price. I saw this beautiful canner in beautiful shape at the antique store for like 20 bucks, but it did not have this weighted counterpiece right here. And I didn't know if I could get it online or not, so I didn't buy it. This weighted counterpiece is very, very important. Likewise, right here, you can barely see it. there's a steam vent. That's what's gonna keep you from blowing up, from, from your worst fears coming true. From, this is what's gonna keep you from having beats on the ceiling. So you really want this little gizmo right here to work and you really want this little gizmo right here to work. These lock into place. And so high acid foods don't need, they are already high acid anaerobic. They can't live in this. The, the bacteria can't live in it. Low acid foods really have to have this. There's not an option. Did my mother can green beans in this, in this right here? No, she canned them in right here. Should I be here to tell the story? No. Likewise, I've been very susceptible to foodborne illness my entire life. I wonder if this has anything to do with it. I don't know. So. You're gonna use a standard recipe and you're gonna use the type of canner that you're supposed to use with the recipe. But another thing that's really important is that if the recipe says chop into one inch chunks, you need to chop into one inch chunks. If it tells you to slice into quarter inch rounds, you need to slice into quarter inch rounds because the thickness of these things determines conduction or convection and it also determines processing time. So that's what it says, one inch cubed, that's why. Now notice here. Do you see right here at the bottom of this thing of peaches, how there's a lot of water here and then they floated to the top? The first time I canned um, peaches and tomatoes, I thought I had messed up. I didn't. 
This is simply because these have a lot of air in them and a lot of water in them, and when you put them under pressure, they will float to the top because I did a raw pack versus a hot pack. If I had cooked this fruit before I put it in there, I would have been able to fill the jar completely and it would not have floated. Now, let's pretend you're my grandmother. When she sees that, what do you think that she sees in that jar? Empty space, is that a good thing? No, because she's feeding 12 kids, does she really want to have to buy any more jars? That's almost a third of the space, right? So now she's gotta open more jars and have more jars on hand. So we'll talk about hot pack and cold pack in a minute, but that's, that's what you're seeing right there, all right? This one is convection, this one is conduction. They're gonna have two different processing times based on how they are um, chopped up. So if you change the recipe, you're gonna alter the density of the product. You don't wanna do that. Let's say you're gonna can salsa. And you put it in the pot and you've cooked it for the 30 minutes it says to do and you say, I don't really, that's not really how I like salsa. I like it thicker than that. I'm just gonna cook it till it gets as thick as I like it. Now you've changed it to be something really different. Adding thickeners, adding more solids, this is all very dangerous. You must follow the recipe exactly. If you change the density, your processing times are no longer valid. So if you don't like the thickness, add thickener before you're serving, not before you can it. We don't really need to worry about this information on altitude since we are like almost below sea level. We don't have a problem with that. This uh, PowerPoint was done by University of Utah. It's available online. If you go to Utah State University, you do a web search for Utah State University Extension <coughs> and do um, home canning, <coughs> pardon me, you will get this beautiful presentation. It has all the notes with it on the bottom. But as altitude increases, you do have to add time and or pressure. So let's talk about raw pack um, versus hot pack. Well, I had this mistaken idea that if I did raw pack canning, that I would have a fresher tasting food, that it would be less cooked, it would be less soft. But you know what? If it's raw pack, you have to process it for longer. So you don't gain anything in that area. Um, Raw pack also tends to discolor quickly than if you hot pack. So if you've got real fussy eaters, and if that carrot is not exactly the right color of orange and your family won't eat it because of that, you really wanna use hot pack. Hot pack, it goes in the jar and it comes out of the jar and it looks just the same for the entire year that it's good, okay? Like I said before, hot pack will also um, float fruits, and I've had tomatoes float as well. Raw pack, some raw pack will tell you just to add the hot canning water to cover the raw food and leave head space. Some will tell you that you can actually use um, not boiling water, but it'll tell you the exact temperature that you need to have. So if you do a raw pack, if it says to heat water to 180 degrees, that's what you need to do. So you have to have a thermometer to know that. Whereas with your hot pack, you always boil the raw food to begin with, and then you pour it into jars. This here says it also improves vacuum and sealed jars and improves shelf life but I haven't ever seen any guidelines for shelf life for hot pack versus raw pack foods. Most everything I see tells me that a home canned product has about a year shelf life. Commercially canned products have a much higher, longer shelf life because they are um, canned under intense heat and in near sterile conditions. So home canning versus commercial canning is different. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, you want to make sure, because that helps you, that's a good question. If you boil the, the vegetable or the fruit in the water, then you use that same water in your hot pack, you're going to keep all that nutrient, right? Likewise, you know how when you buy a canned product, you might rinse those beans and throw that water out? 
You don't have to do that with your home canned carrots, your home canned beans. That's good stuff. That's stock. You're going to pay $1.49 for a little tiny thing like this in the grocery store of it. So, yes, that's good water, and you can use it. You may have to add more to it if you run out to plain water, but you can use that same water, yes. Um, raw pack processes for 40 minutes. Hot pack processes for 35 minutes you're going to get the same looking product at the end, only one you're going to have floating fruit and one you're not. Let me share words of wisdom from someone who has had multiple disasters in the canning arena. Prepare one batch at a time and follow instructions exactly. Yes, but also be prepared. For example, what is something that you're thinking about canning? Pardon me? Pears. pears. What I would do if I were going to can pears is the day before I would procure my fruit. Now, another word of wisdom. Canning does not improve the quality of any food. You must start out with perfect fruit. This is not a way to preserve going to the market and buying end of the day or last week semi-mushy pears that still taste pretty good, they're safe, will not be a good canned product. You want to start out with mature, ripe, perfect fruit. I would procure it the day before or perhaps two days before, depending on the ripeness. I would set it all out on a counter so I could inspect it, sort the good from the bad. So if there are bad in the bottom of your um, bushel or half bushel or peck container, You've got them separated away from your fruit, so you've got to, you know what you've got is good and one's not causing the other to go bad. I would have all my jars cleaned and sterilized. Um, if, you're hot, if you're pressure canning, you don't have to sterilize. I simply put mine in the dishwasher. That'll get them clean enough to work with. I would make sure that I had all my lids, all my rings done already. I would have my, syrups, my sugar syrup pre-made. So that the next morning when I go to can, I'm ready to go. I have my canner set up. I've got my jars done. I simply have to peel um, and core my fruit. Of course, I do pears, the little ones. I can them whole. I don't even core them. I peel them, but I don't core them. Don't get as many in a jar, but they're really pretty on the shelf. <laughs> and sometimes I have a friend who has a friend who has a friend. I think there's about three friends removed. Somebody has a pear tree that's very prolific. So I often come into a nice free stash of little tiny pears that are just beautiful canned whole. But I have everything ready to go. So the next day when I get up and I can, my kitchen is clean. I have all my towels, I have everything ready to go. If you go out to the farmer's market tomorrow, you procure your pears. You have to prepare everything before you start. You're gonna be exhausted by the end of the time because once you start it, you want to finish it. Sugar measured out, sugar measured out, yes. Or syrups made, have everything done in advance. Have your brine solution made if you're making pickles. Do everything in advance that you can do. Make sure you've got enough fruit fresh. Ooh, having to make a run to the grocery store in the middle of a canning day is not good for my mood. So do you have enough sugar? Do you really still have that extra bag? Do you have the spices for pickles? Do you have everything ready to go? And have you made it clear to all members in your household that that stuff better not disappear? <laughs> all right? Um, do you have enough clean kitchen towels or paper towels, depending on what you're going to be doing, because you're going to need these things? Now, something to remember. When you are canning food, vegetables, you do not have to add any salt. Salt is not part of the preservation process. However, have you noticed in the grocery store, if you go to buy canned green beans, that the less expensive green beans may often have more sodium in them? And the better brand name green beans, more expensive, may have less sodium? Well, what sodium does is it preserves the cell wall. So if you start out with the green bean that is not as perfect as it could be, if you add sodium, it will help 
it retain a higher level of, of um, texture quality. Not safety, just texture quality. So if you want the can without sodium, you really want the can perfect product. If you have less than perfect product, you might want to try uh, using a little salt. Per personally, the reason I can is to escape sodium. That's why I do it. So you can add salt if desired. It has nothing to do with the safety of the product. Okay, here's one that I thought was ridiculous. I wasn't going to do it. I decided I was not going to bubble free. Bubble free. Take two minutes and free the bubbles from your jar. You'll have a nicer product when you get done. I think that what happens is that the product doesn't get so beat up in the canning process and it looks much nicer in the jar and then your head space is accurate because every type of canning, all your recipes are going to tell you how much head space to have between the liquid and the top of the jar. And bubbles everywhere affects that. Notice what this is. This is a plastic spatula. It's not a metal butter knife because you don't want to do anything that could chip this jar. Okay. Here's another thing that I thought was ridiculous. Wiping down the mouth of the jar. I used a funnel. How much stuff could be on there? Enough stuff to keep the jar from sealing. So if I've gone through all this, I really want my jars to seal, right? Okay. Assemble the lid. You've already wiped this off. This lid right here has already been heated in a pan and set for several minutes. You don't have to boil it, but it needs to be a nice hot water on the stove. These are single use. If you can this year and next year you're gonna can again, don't save these. When you open this jar of green beans, these are gone. These, if you wipe them off and store them, you'll never buy any more. I've got some that were my grandmother's. They last forever if you wipe them down and keep them um, dry. If you do not heat these, your jar will not seal. Likewise, let's say I thought I was canning these beans and I thought I was going to have eight quarts and I put eight lids into my simmering water and lo and behold, I miscalculated and I only had seven quarts. This lid that I heated is now trash. I don't reuse them because I don't want to take the chance on it not sealing for the cost of this little tiny lid. So once you heat them, I've had problems with reusing them and the jar not sealing. Okay. You've got the jar cleaned, you've bubble freed it, you've put the lid on it, now you're gonna put the, mail, the metal band on it. People, you do not need the Incredible Hulk to seal these jars. You do not need to ramp down on them. It's fingertip tight, <laughs> done. If you go too hard, you have problems. If you go not hard enough, you have problems. That's what headspace looks like, right there. From the liquid to here. That's what headspace is. Jams and jellies, fruits and tomatoes, low acid foods, meats and vegetables, there they are. It affects the processing temperature, so just don't be tempted to put one more spoonful in there. Uh, I know it's hard, I wanna do it too, but don't. They're telling you again about your finger tightening your jars and your lids. If you're too tight, the air can't escape. The lid will buckle, you won't get a seal. If it's too loose, you're gonna open up your can and you're gonna have gump in there. Applesauce, tomatoes, whatever you've got. After you process it, do not touch the lid. Okay. Doesn't matter what your pot looks like. They can look, any of these are fine. But the thing that you want to make sure of is that you have a rack, that there's enough room for the head space, for the water to cover and have the head space in here. Now, if you go onto the internet, you're gonna see all these cool new steam canners. There's, it's so enticing, it's so green, you use less water, it heats quicker. There are no guidelines yet established for canning with steam, these steam canners. So if you can with a steam canner, you are running the risk um, of not having a properly canned product. 
Just say no to steam canners. Pressure canners, this is really important. Oh, let me go back a minute. When you're doing boiling water canning, you've got your basket in, your jars are sitting in your basket, you've got the lid on, you've turned the, the water on, on high, and before you ever put the, your jars in here, your water ought to be simmering, a low simmer. You don't want to start from zero. You put your jars in, you crank it up, and now you have to wait for it to come to a boil. You're going to hear it when it boils. That's the point in time you begin to time, is once you hear it come to a boil. If at any time during that process that boil is broken, you must start over. So if your teenage child comes through the kitchen, smells something good, and wants to open the pan to see what you got cooking, at that point in time you shut it and you have to start all your processing all over again. If that boil is ever broken, do not lift the lid from the point of time that you begin to process. And I don't know about you, but there's people in my family that cannot stand a lid on a pot. They must see it, okay? Same thing follows through with pressure canning. Once you get this, you've got your jars in, you've got your water in, you've got everything locked down, you've got your gauge in place, you've got your vent right here, you're turning it on, this little piece, this little counterweight piece, you're going to start seeing that's going to rock a little bit and this is going to start venting steam. This is going to come to pressure. You have to wait for the vent at least 10 minutes and to be at pressure before you can start counting. Now, you've got this on your stove, you've got it cranked up, you see this dial climbing to the 10 pounds or 15 pounds. You have to stay right there because once it starts climbing, you're going to have to adjust your heat. Is once it gets near, oh, say, eight pounds, it's going to fly. It's going to really go up quickly. So you want to sit there and watch, and as it climbs, you want to start turning your heat down so that it goes slower, 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 till it reaches your, your uh, recommended processing time, I mean processing pounds of pressure. Usually um, that's 10 or 15 pounds, depending on the recipe and what you're doing. If at any time this gauge goes down below the recommended processing amount, you have to start again. This is what happened to me. I'm doing, last year I'm doing green beans. I've got it up. I've got it all gauged up. I'm watching it. I'm watching it. Oh, yeah, I've got it just perfect. Great. So I've set my timer. I go in the living room to do something. I come back in, and I'm dinking around, dinking around. And somehow I must have rubbed up against the stove and I look over and this is sitting at like eight pounds. So either I brushed up against the stove or I cut it down too much so I had to start all over again with my processing time. Again, check your dials every year. Check your gaskets every year. Now if you find a nice canner at the um, used store or at an antique store, if this gauge isn't any good, that's okay. You can buy a gauge separately. You can order gauges separately online. Likewise, if the seal is no good, that's okay too. You can buy a seal online. But keep in mind, you're not going to be able to can next week with it because you're probably going to have to order it and wait for it to come. Cooling jars. In part of your setup, you have to have a place that you can remove these jars from the pan and let them sit there overnight. Or... 12 to 24 hours. Um, you don't take the screw band off. Oops. You don't take the screw band off until it's cooled. But once it's cool, you could take it off and use it. You don't have to store it with the screw band on. You only have to store it with, with the lid on. Notice this little gizmo right here. This is a jar grabber. Well worth $2.99. Buy one. Because getting these out of boiling water is not safe to reach in there any other way. Likewise, um, they have another small gizmo. It's called a jar wand, and it has a magnet on the bottom of it, and it allows you to pick up lids from your simmering water one by one, which is another two bucks, 
well worth your time. A funnel, well worth your money and time. You can buy this whole set at a hardware store online for about $20. You can get the bubble freer, the jar, um, get her outer, that's a highly technical term. Boy, somebody at MSU is going to have a fit when they hear that. And uh, The wand, all together you can get all those out in one little convenient package. Worth your money, have them. But you have to let them sit for 12 to 24 hours. Once you get them on the counter, you're going either whether they're pressure canned or hot water bath canned, you're going to start hearing a beautiful sound. Pop, pop, pop. It's a beautiful sound. But the ultimate test is, is their concave here? When you touch it, is it tight? Or is it a high-pitched sound when you ding it with a spoon? If any of these don't happen, you don't have a sealed product. So you got a couple of choices. You can reprocess within 24 hours for the whole processing time. You can refrigerate it, you can freeze it, or you can eat it. So, in your canning schedule, you want to plan time to check your jars so that somebody's looking at them so you know you don't, if I'm canning today at 10 a.m., tomorrow at 10 a.m., I need to make sure that every one of these has sealed or I need to do something or I'm going to lose them. So at the very best, somebody can check them. I make sure they get into the refrigerator if they haven't sealed. Once I started wiping the tops of my jars, it was like magic. They all started sealing. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a little information on jars. Mayonnaise jars, do not use them. Leftover jars, do not use them. You want to use jars that are specifically designed for canning, and they are, they're going to have on this jar, there's going to be an imprint that says Mason, it's going to say ball, it's going to say car. You want a jar specifically designed for canning. Likewise, antique jars, the blue ones, those are not safe. They were designed to use with zinc metal lids. We don't can with those anymore. This up here should have two bands. There'll be two bands going across here. And this type of ring should fit on the jar if you can use it. So I have some beautiful canning jars, of course, that were my grandmother's that are hand-blown glass. They're beautiful. They don't get canned in. I can put dried beans in them. I can put dried vegetables in them. I can look at them and remember when they were full of my grandmother's beautiful canned foods, but I will not can in them. Likewise, jars are another good find buying used. Sometimes you can get uh, usually a dozen jars costs about $10. It's not uncommon to find a dozen jars um, at a yard sale for a dollar or two. But you have to make sure there's no chips up here and that nothing is interfered with this seam that's around here. When you put the, the seal lid on the uh -huh. part and you get it out of the water, does it have to be dry before you put it on top of the jar? The, this part right here, does this have to be dry? Not the, not the ring. The, oh, the lid? The lid no, the lid. no, you don't dry it. You put it straight on there. It can have the water on it. Okay. Straight on it. Mm -hmm. And you're taking it right out of that hot water? Right out of the hot water, right drop it right on the top, and then put my, my ring on it. Mm -hmm. Now, last year I had somebody call me and she was very sad because her son-in-law, who is um, a chemical engineer, told her that she should not heat the, her jar lids, that rubber degrades in heat, so she did not, and what she had was 32 quarts of tomatoes that did not seal. She was unhappy. And I explained to her that perhaps this was true for other rubber, but the rubber that is in the seals of these were designed to be heated. That's what activates the seal. So I dare say they had words. But she had 32 quarts of tomatoes that she had to reprocess. Luckily she did call me in time so she could reprocess them. Removing the metal screw bands, like I said, clean it, dry it, put it in a box. Um, if they get rusted, I don't use them because it's really hard to get them off. I just throw them away. Let's go back in time a little bit before we talk about storing this food. Let's say you've just done a can or load of a low acid 
food, say carrots. You've done your canning time, let's say it was um, 25 minutes at um, 11 pounds of pressure. You've done it, You're, you've reached your time, you turn it off. At that point, now you're waiting. You're waiting for the pressure to come all the way down and you must wait for the pressure to come down before you can open the canner. Now, you will find people on the internet telling you all kinds of handy things you can do to cut this time. Oh, you could submerge that canner in cold water. Does that sound safe? It's totally not safe. You could put a cold towel on top of the canner. Does that sound safe? No, it is not safe either. That time is actually figured in the processing time, the time it is sitting waiting for the, the pressure to come down, you have to wait. While you're waiting for that to come down, you could be preparing your jars for your next load. You could be peeling, you can be coring, you can be doing other things, getting ready for your next canner load. But you cannot um, push that time. Likewise, when you turn the heat off from a hot water bath canner, you need to wait five minutes before you lift that lid. Keep you from getting burned, and that completes your whole cycle. So you start the canner off, the hot water bath. You start it off like this simmer. Uh huh. You put your jars in. Yes. When it comes up to a boil, is when you start your processing time. Correct. Recommended. And then you turn it off, wait five minutes, and then take them out. Yes. And then you're going to look. You're probably going to have to add a little bit of water for the next round, and you're ready to put your next round in your canner and go again. So if you were to say do jam like I did last year where you put it in when it was boiling and processed it for the seven minutes or whatever and then took it out right after the seven minutes, is that unsafe? Should I chuck them? What do you mean? Um, you put them in boiling. So that is safer than not having put them in boiling. It's a wonder that your jars didn't crack. So you were lucky that your jars didn't crack. You've been eating them all along, so it may be safe for you to eat them, but I wouldn't eat them. I wouldn't want you to feed it to me. Even though what you've got is a very low risk food because you've got a lot of sugar content and you've got a high acid food, which makes for a very low rate of bacteria growth. And we know we don't have to worry about botulism because it's already a high acid food. So it would be up to you. Storing this food, I know it's tempting. That looks so much like my grandmother's pantry. I know it is tempting to put this stuff out on the counter or on a bookshelf or somewhere out where people can see that. So you can say, na, 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 na. I'm going to be eating this while you're eating the stuff from the store. Aren't I impressive? But you really want to put it somewhere where it's dark. You can open up your pantry when people come to visit. And they could see it that way and then shut the doors back again because light really does degrade them. There's that steam canner I was talking to you about, which really isn't safe. University of Utah says um, that you can use these if you're doing um, some fruit, jams and jellies. I still feel like it's not safe. We don't have anything that tells us that we should do that. If the USDA says not to do it, I don't do it. Salsa. Oh my goodness, doesn't everybody have their own favorite salsa recipe? Don't we want to can it? Don't we want to be uh, Paul Newman reincarnate? Don't we want to do that again? You can't. You must use a standard salsa recipe and then you can alter it when you put it on the table. There are a few things that you can make in substitution and be safe. Okay, if it calls for vinegar, you can use bottled lemon juice, not fresh squeezed. Bottled lemon juice has been controlled for pH. Fresh lemons have different pHs, but you can't go backwards. You could change the types of dried spices and herbs. Let's say you don't really like basil, but you really dig oregano. You could double your oregano and not put any basil in it. So, but the ultimate volume has to remain the same. If the volume is two teaspoons of dried herb, two teaspoons of dried herb still need to go in there. Which dried herb doesn't matter. You can change the amount of peppers proportionally. So if you have a little, you want to reduce the hot peppers, you can add more green peppers. 
If you want more hot peppers, then you can reduce green peppers. But your total volume has to remain the same. If the total volume of hot plus green peppers equals one cup, you gotta have one cup in there. See, don't do the friend of the friend. Do not change the thickness of the recipe by adding more tomatoes, starch, cooking it longer. Don't leave out the added acid. Different tomatoes have different pHs. Now, last year, I was one of those people that wanted to wait till the very peak of the season when tomatoes are the cheapest. And I was gonna do all this massive canning. And then every tomato vine in Kent County became blighted, which changes the pH of the tomato, which means it cannot be canned. So I canned approximately one third of what I would have normally canned because I waited too late and the vines were blighted. You may not can tomatoes from a blighted vine. So you can freeze them and you can eat them, but you cannot can them using standard times. So that salsa recipe, you can do it fresh, you can freeze it, or you can process it in a pressure canner using pressure canning times. But you know what? It's not gonna have the same texture. So 35 minutes, at, um, for us it wouldn't be 13 pounds, it'd probably be 11 pounds pressure. So if you add beans, look how many, how many minutes you process if you add a protein food to it. It's not gonna be the salsa that you're used to eating. So, a couple of questions here that people ask frequently. Can you use non-nutritive sweeteners in preserving food? Like if you want to do peaches and you want to make, um, you want to add your sweetener to your peaches before you process them. It's not recommended. Non-nutritive sweeteners tend to take on strange flavors. Even though Splenda is heat, um, it, it is heat tolerant. You're, you're gonna have a better product if you just do it without any sugar at all, and then add the Splenda. However, sugar also does preserve the cell wall with fruit, and so a fruit preserved with sugar is gonna be a premium fruit as far as texture goes. Not safety, just texture. But then, you know, then you've got the sugar. Do you really want the calories? Do you want the sugar? You have to decide. Table salt, oh my, I've done this. Do not pickle with table salt. Do not can with table salt because it has iodine in it and it also has anti-caking agents, which do not do well in canning. You really want to use canning salt. Some kosher salt you can use if it has no iodine and it tells you on the label, ingredients, salt, no um, anti-caking agent. Is it safe to bake and store cakes in canning jars? No. And that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> We've talked about my grandma's recipes. There's not safe to use. Do you need, um, to do extra acid and heirloom versus regular tomatoes? No. They've been figured using um, guidelines all across the board. What about canning butter? No. Canning garlic and oil? Not safe. It's too dense. Canning uh, pureed pumpkin, pureed butternut squash, it's too dense. If you want to can pumpkin or squash, you have to cube it. Likewise, there are no canning guidelines for zucchini or yellow squash now. Um, the varieties have changed, so if you want to preserve zucchini or yellow squash, you need to freeze them. There are no canning guidelines for them now. So, the USDA's complete guide to home canning is on UGA's website. The National Food Safety Database um, and FreshPreserving.com are guaranteed to all be safe. This PowerPoint presentation will be on our website for you to download. There will also be, if you go to the food preservation tab on the website, there's a canning guide, a freezing guide, and a drying guide that you can download uh, and choose whatever you like. There's also a shorthand out there for drying herbs and a shorthand out if you just want to do tomatoes. Can I answer any questions? Applesauce. Applesauce. Oh, applesauce is a wonderful thing, especially if you have a food mill or a squeezo. Is anybody familiar with those? Okay. If you've got a food mill and you want to, if you're going to do applesauce or salsa 
or tomato sauce, it's well worth the money it will take you to invest it. You because it no, it's a it has a hopper on the top. You place your um, softened. For example, when I make applesauce, I bake the apples. Quarter them. I do not peel them. I do not core them. I quarter them. I bake them until they are soft. You put the whole thing in the food mill. You you press it down, and then you turn it. It separates the peel from the fruit. A small one will do that too. Um, depends on how much you're going to be doing. I'm, if I'm going to can, I'm going to can, you know, 40 quarts or 40 pints. So I'm doing a lot. So I wanted to run. You could do it very quickly. Likewise with um, applesauce, you can put the peels back through and do it one more time so that you have the very least amount of waste possible. But applesauce is um, a high acid food. It's hot water bath canned. Um, you can add sugar or not. You don't have to. It's your choice. So you would have... Um, I don't put it in because I think that uh, there are some recipes that may allow you to, but I don't do that because I think as a general rule over time, um, unless you're pickling, spices take on different flavors. I think they're best fresh. So with applesauce or salsa, you might want to get a food meal. Um, tomato sauce, you might want to get a food meal. I also recommend that people buy these together, two or three people buy it and share it, and then you could draw for who has to store it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, it, there are very few times are you going to, everybody in your neighborhood is going to be canning all at once. So it's really nice. This is a great way to share and meet your neighbors. Is this, I have an old water bath canner from 35 years ago. That's probably still good. I haven't used it for If you've got a hot water bath canner that came over on the Mayflower, <laughs> if it has no, it has the, thing. And the it has the rack. And if the rack is rusted, it doesn't matter. If it has a good fitting lid and you can hold it up and there's no rust places that could break through in the canning process, you've got a viable piece of equipment that you should Bars use and enjoy. If they're not cracked or anything, are they still going to be used? They're, I, they're ball. If they, have, if they are the ones that have the double ring at the top and they are designed to use modern lids and rings, yes. If they've got the single ring around the top and they were designed to be used with um, zinc top jars, no. Zinc top lids, no. If there's any bubbles that you can see in the glass, you know it's not a good jar to use. Any other questions? Is anybody going to grow their own food to a can? Because that could be tricky because you have to have enough at once to make it worth your time. Next year. Next year. I've tried it. I live in the city, so having enough of anything at one time is really hard. If you're going to have a small garden, you may find that freezing is a more viable option for you to preserve um, homegrown food unless you've got enough tomatoes coming in all at once where it's worth your time to set up. Um, also on the UGA website or um, soeasytopreserve.com, if you have any, any reservations whatsoever, they sell a beautiful DVD that you can purchase and it takes you step by step through all canning, freezing, pickling processes. You, it is so good you can literally put it in your kitchen, on your laptop, and go through the process with them. It's a beautiful, beautiful video. Um, that's another one that would be well served to uh, share between a couple of folks. I do have one here, actually I have two here, and I can loan them. Um, and you're welcome, when I loan them you can have them for a week. So if you're getting ready to go and you're feeling a little bit antsy, you're willing to call and check out one of uh, my videos. That's so easy to preserve.com? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I sent one to Miss Vanessa, so she has one. That's what she's raving about. Yeah, that's what she's raving about. Do you have a good recipe for salsa? Did the, you it on the, website? the one on the National Center for Home Food Preservation which you can, get, you can get to that link through UGA, has got a great sauce, and they also have a great spaghetti sauce. Um, both of their recipes are excellent. Do you buy, like, the, the Sure Gel recipes? Those are fun. Um, so for, 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 yes, Sure Gel is another very good um, resource for jams and jellies. However, you need to make sure if you're doing pie filling that you use clear gel, that you do not use a corn thickener, corn starch. You must use clear gel. All recipes are formulated using clear gel, and that 
sometimes has to be ordered on the internet. On occasion, you can find it at the health food store. Um, King Arthur, the folks out in Lowell, make it. You may be able to get it from their store, but you can get it online as well. But you need to use clear gel if you're doing pie filling. Personally, I just freeze mine. I don't can it, I freeze it. And I don't really need to be making that many pies. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Likewise, you may call me. I am your voice of uh, food preservation and food safety in Kent County. So if you start along the process and you find something not working or you forget or you have a question, call and I will try to answer your question as best I can. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. <laughs>